So, good morning folks and thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. It is definitely a special privilege to come and talk to at the OVS summit. Uh, you know Ben and Justin have played a very important role in success of SDN and so far the history of SDN and similarly OVS and the OVS community has played a very important role uh, in uh, driving SDN forward uh, and making it successful so far. So, definitely it a privilege to be able to come and talk to you. Uh, I should mention that lately that is for last several years I have been mostly giving talks that are kind of uh, promoting open networking, open networking foundation and its projects and as a result my talks have gotten less and less technical and uh, they do not have as much depth. So, please be patient with me coming and talking to a developer group uh, with not having enough technical depth is making me a little bit nervous, but hopefully what I am going to tell you, you will find interesting and useful as well. Okay. So, with that um, I want to get into the topic of the talk which is uh, called, uh, which is a, a system solutions platform that we have been building at Open Networking Foundation with uh, a pretty big community uh, and I want to tell you about that and how it is becoming a platform to kind of reinvent the network edge and tell you more about that in just a minute. But uh, just to get you started to get you a little more interested in COD, now, by the way how many of you have heard about COD before? Can I get a, uh, okay so there are a number of you that have not, so okay hopefully um, you will find this uh, uh, useful. So, if you look at you know these analyst reports come out every once in a while, again one should take these reports with a grain of salt, uh, we do not want to believe in everything these reports come out, but still it is very interesting to see what couple of these people are saying, Michael Howard who has been an analyst in service provider industry for a long time. Uh, he did a study and all of that and came to the conclusion that 70 percent of operators are planning to deploy COD. Uh, another uh, study uh, by heavy reading says nearly 40 percent of all the consumer traffic will go over COD. Now, as I said, you know, one should not take these things too seriously, but if you take a minute, uh, COD is maybe a two year old open source platform, has not really, uh, you know, uh, commercialized as yet. And still, uh, if you are hearing these kinds of predictions, it is very encouraging and um, something to say you know, why that is the case. Uh, just to again give you some idea that uh, at Open Networking Foundation we do interact uh, with many service providers around the globe and these are some of the service providers that we have been working with and their interest in uh, COD. Um, and what you will see is that there are three variants of COD that I am going to describe. Uh, one is called R COD that stands for residential. Uh, so that you can connect over GPON or XGSPON uh, network uh, from home. Uh, then there is the M cord which is the mobile cord that you can connect over cellular wireless uh, 4G, 5G in the future. And then there is the enterprise cord which is for enterprises to connect to central offices over uh, <coughs> metro ethernet. And what we are noticing is that this con is continuing to grow almost on a monthly basis, more and more providers are wanting to. Uh, try COD, they are trying it in the labs and so on. Um, and we have done many uh, POCs and lab trials and now there are providers that are taking it to field trial and then hopefully will leading to production deployment as well. So then you know you, you want to wonder why is that the case, that why are so many providers um, wanting to um, you know deal with COD. So, let me tell you a little bit of the history how it has come about and then before I go into some of the architecture and technical details. So, the first is it started almost two or three years ago when we were working with AT&T primarily. Uh, and uh, as you know a service provider like AT&T operates something like 5000 central offices. So, these are the facilities that come all the way in the neighborhood. And these are the facility central offices if you do not know, these are relatively large facilities that service providers operate and from these facilities they connect to their consumers, uh, residential uh, subscribers over say DSL or GPON or whatever. Then they connect to their um, enterprise customers 
uh, over metro ethernet or uh, some kind of uh, optical networks and then they also connect to their cellular networks, I mean cellular customers uh, bringing in the backhaul traffic into the central office and then it goes into the backbone network. These are facilities that have evolved over 40, 50 years for AT&T, Verizon or those kinds of providers and these are, you know, facilities where they have 300 different types of boxes, these are closed, proprietary, not programmable, everything that you know has led to SBN and why SBN is a good thing, right? And so two, two and a half years ago or whatever, maybe three years ago at this point, AT&T and we were talking that if we have to reinvent the central office, how would we do it? If you were doing a clean slate central office, how would we do it? Uh, the second question we were asking is if Google or Amazon or Facebook, the kind of typical cloud provider were doing a central office today, how would they go about building a central office? And that is what led to COD and I will tell you more in just a minute. And then as we started to build COD, we realized that cable operators, it's not only AT&T, but some of the cable operators also care about, they have what is called head end, not central offices. And they have similar problems that central office and then they would like to reinvent uh, central off, I mean the head ends, uh, so that they became interested. Then uh, as you know, there's a lot of excitement and hype about 5G. And so there is an opportunity to see whether you can build a platform that can support 5G and all the capability that 5G is expecting. And so that led to more momentum. Uh, then there are this group of companies and providers and vendors that are talking about what is called mobile edge computing because more and more as people are wanting to use the handheld devices, uh, more and more sophisticated services and as you transition to something like 5G, uh, people are wanting to provide more edge computing from where you can provide lower latency, better performance and all of that. And so those people need a platform and they thought maybe COD could be uh, an interesting platform for them to work with. And then finally, I'm sure you're hearing about a lot of about fog computing. This is another edge uh, initiative that is going on. And there they are again talking about some very interesting application in the IoT space and so on. And they also need a platform that can do some networking, computing and all of that at the edge of the network. And again, it turns out potentially COD can be a good target for them, okay? So that is what I mean uh, that it could be a network edge platform. Another way to look at this is uh, if you look at many service providers, almost all of them are wanting to build what can be thought of as a multi-tier cloud, okay? And in the multi-tier you can see at the edge is of course the users, then there's the edge cloud, then there's the telco cloud and that can connect to public clouds of Amazon, Google, um, and so on, right? So this is kind of what the cloud uh, hierarchy that is evolving. And now if you look at the edge of the network, again, you don't really want to be providing the edge cloud with the legacy central offices, or if you really want to support AR, VR, and those kinds of application, people are saying we have to reinvent the network edge. And when they think about that, you know, some of the things is that at the edge, people are talking about why they want to do processing at the edge is to provide lower latency, uh, to be able to have kind of feedback control loop that are much tighter than what you could if you have to go all the way to the public cloud and so on. And also, if I'm AT&T or Verizon or service provider, if I have all these facilities that come very, very close to the edge of the network and close to my consumers, uh, then I want to find a way to leverage it. Uh, and as a result, they are interested to see if they can deploy a programmable infrastructure there on which they can run services, maybe they can compete better with the OTT providers. So honestly, that is another motivation some of the service providers have to be able to invent the edge of the network or reinvent the network edge, okay? And so, you know, so that is where you can imagine card can, uh, is a platform and then you, of course, need some global automation and orchestration as well, okay? And then, uh, people that are talking about the fog computing, they are wanting to take that edge all the way into the enterprise and as a result, one could think about deploying it in that context as well. Okay, so this is kind of the high level motivation or the context in which COD is the platform uh, that we are working on and uh, with the community. Okay, so now let me take you through some of the details. 
Okay. So, what is the requirement for a platform that if you want to deploy in this edge cloud or network edge? And so, you can think about it from the functionality point of view and you can think about it in terms of approach or how do you want to build it. So, functionality again, you know, a service delivery platform. If I am a, uh, even if I am a at and team, I am more and more interested in delivering services and do not want to deliver only connectivity. Uh, whether they will succeed at this or not, that uh, the time will tell, but at least they have a motivation that they want to be more a service delivery uh, kind of a company and they need a platform they can help build new uh, services on top. Uh, because the central offices have very different configurations, sometimes when they are really remote, there is a very constrained space and power requirements. Okay? And then there are some central offices that are pretty large facilities and they are almost like a you know, warehouse multi-storied uh, facilities. And so, you should be able to build a platform that can serve those different configurations. Okay? Uh, and then as I mentioned that there are different access technologies. You may be coming over DSL, GPON, XGSPON, you may be coming over LTE, maybe in the future 5G and all of that. So, there are many different access technologies that come in and you should be able to plug into those access technologies. Of course, you want programmable control because that is what the SDN is all about and you want to build networks and infrastructure that allow that. Uh, and then economics of a data center so that you know, you do not want to build it the old fashioned way with lots of proprietary closed devices. You want to build it with few devices that are merchant silicon, white box, open source based and you can replicate that. That is how you get the economics of a data center and that is what you want to do. And then of course, the configuration and operation is equally important and so on. But I think in addition to functionality, the approach is equally important and that is maybe more relevant in this context that is you really want to build with merchant silicon white box and open source, right? I mean that is the way to build platforms and that is how you can uh, do it right and you can have community and then you can uh, kind of innovate faster and all of that. That is kind of the way to do this. You need a community like this. Uh, future proof uh, that is really as you know that it is very, very difficult to predict services. We can all think about AR, VR and all these people are imagining, but end of the day once you have a platform you never know what a high school student or a college undergrad is going to invent and that is going may become the default or most popular uh, service. So, you have to make sure that you uh, plan for that. Okay? And uh, this is a quote that someone, um, John Donovan from at and uh, once used in ONS where somebody said then what is the role of proprietary either software or proprietary hardware or something and he gave a very good answer and he said that proprietary stuff should be more like a Tabasco sauce. That is you only sprinkle it to get the value and the taste, but that is not what you build your infrastructure with going forward and I think that is uh, becoming more true uh, as we go forward. Okay. So, then let me see if you start with that as a generic set of requirements, then here is you know how one can imagine an architecture, it does not need a rocket science to figure this out. So, what you see on the left hand side is all the access devices or access um, kind of users, right, either from enterprise or residential or wireless that are coming in to this access platform or an uh, edge uh, platform and you may have some wired devices and you may have some uh, wireless devices. Okay? And then of course, from the edge you want to connect to the backbone, so you need some connectivity there as well. So, again no rocket science and then if you are going to run services and more and more functions, even network functions into software, you of course need servers, maybe servers with acceleration, but you need some server. And when you look at all of this, obviously you need connectivity among them and so if you are going to have physical connectivity, you need a switching fabric. Okay. So, I suppose again, so this is if you are trying to design a network edge and a platform, this is something you can easily think of and then of course, you need on top of that some kind of a software stack and that is a software stack that can really help you uh, deliver services. So, you can think of that software stack as nothing but a service delivery platform and then on top of that, you will have many known and unknown services uh, that you should be able to build. So, I suppose when you look at this, it is pretty straightforward. I mean, there is nothing, does it make sense? I mean, am I communicating is this? So far, so good. I mean, it makes sense, right? 
okay. So now what I want to do is that if this makes sense then I want to just tell you how we have built COD using this generic architecture and how we have used the same approach and philosophy that we talked about before. Okay. Oh, by the way, I forgot there is another thing because you need provisioning, configuration and all of that, you need some of the tool chain or something that can help you do that as well. Okay. So now let me give you some specifics of what we have done. So when it comes to enterprises, we have used Metro Ethernet to bring that in and the good news in the Metro Ethernet space is that those access devices are already built primarily with merchant silicon, those are white boxes, uh, one are you and then you can get them and so the good news is there we had to do relatively very little to be able to enable that or use that. But when it comes to the residential access, then what you need is either the GPON OLT, optical line termination or you need now as we are people are going to the next generation 10 gig uh, symmetric, then you need XGSPON OLT. Now there we had to do lot more work because if you look at OLTs today that uh, companies like Nokia, Huawei, uh, Alcatel, de Lucent uh, they sell, these are the large vertical devices or typically what you know about the, the routers, right? Everything, you know, proprietary silicon, own kind of uh, hardware, own um, uh, OLT operating system and all of that, very close proprietary boxes. And so in order to build it according to the philosophy or approach that we wanted to take, we had to make sure that those devices are also built with merchant silicon, white boxes and open source and I will give you some examples of what we have done in that area. Similarly, when you are talking about connecting to radio networks, uh, the E node B that you may be familiar with or you may be familiar with base stations, the base stations are another examples in the networking space that are built the old fashioned way that is close proprietary big boxes that people sell and they are not necessarily programmable, they are not open for innovation and all of that. So again what we have done in that space is to open them up being able to build radio access networks or E node B's uh, using as much merchant silicon, open source, white boxes as we could and we have made um, a lot of progress there. Uh, when it comes to servers, we use OCP servers, again they are you know uh, thing and then when you connect to the backbone network, typically you do it using something called rodems and rodems are yet another devices that are pretty uh, you know close proprietary boxes and we have tried to now even disaggregate those rodems, make them SDN enabled and be able to control them with an external control plane and so those are the types of devices we have done. Uh, when it comes to fabric, uh, again in a central office this is not common but in a data center as you know you build a fabric using leaf spine uh, architecture, uh, it is right now it is all open flow enabled uh, fabric, underlay fabric, overlay fabric and we use OVS uh, for overlay fabric and more and more we are moving to P4 enabled uh, devices and the P4 enabled uh, fabric as well. Uh, they are all white boxes um, you know from ODMs. Uh, and we use ONOS if you haven't heard of so that is the SDN controller or SDN operating system that we developed at ONF and that is the operating system SDN controller we use and then there are many fabric applications on top of ONOS. Okay? So that is kind of the, the, the basic infrastructure that we have built uh, for the cord and I will get into more details in just a minute and then there is a software stack. So because we are using virtualization and all of that we start with OpenStack more and more we are moving to Docker and now uh, Kubernetes uh, so that we can use those uh, virtual network functions and services implemented in containers. And then uh, we have another platform that we have built and I will uh, get into more details on XOS which is stand for everything as a service operating system. So that is the platform that lets you think of everything as a service and then be able to uh, do compo service composition, service lifetime management and all of that we do that with XOS and then on top of that we have built you know uh, 25 plus services. Some services are for residential context, some services are for kind of the mobile wireless context and some are for enterprise and some are just cloud services. So that is kind of the portfolio of services that looks like uh, on, that we have built on this platform. And then you know we are working towards making this platform uh, kind of zero touch or automated configuration and operation. 
Uh, right now, I will say if you use everything that we specify, you can get close to zero touch. But if you deviate from that configuration, uh, we still have a long ways before we can make it truly a zero touch configuration in operation. Okay? So, and again, as I mentioned all along, everything done with merchant silicon white boxes and open source. Okay. So, uh, in next whatever 20 minutes, I will try to give you a little bit of an idea about uh, underlying technology. Uh, again, I may not be able to go deep into any of these, but if you are interested, you know, we are open source organization, all the information is out there and happy to provide more details. So, this is the leaf spine fabric that we have built uh, with open flow enabled white boxes. Uh, we use um, uh, open network Linux, um, which is you know originally done by Big Switch, now distributed by OCP uh, and Oni and all of that. And then on top of that, there is the OpenFlow agent, uh, Indigo-based OpenFlow agent on Broadcom's OFDPA. So that those are the boxes and the software stack we use. And then we use Onos as the SDN controller. And then there are many applications uh, that you have to build in order to really make the fabric usable and you know, that we have done in this context, okay? Um, so, but when you think about the software stack, I want to quickly give you an idea about what the software stack besides the fabric looks like. So when you come from the access side, what you will see the, at from home, you, there is the op, ONU device, optical network unit. It goes to OLT, which is like the aggregation uh, for GPON, uh, uh, optical line termination. And as I mentioned, we turn that into a white box. Uh, Volta that provide the hardware abstraction across many different types of OLT devices. Again, we use ONAS as the SDN controller because those OLTs are now open flow and SDN enabled devices. And then there are many applications on the access side that ride on top of ONAS. The same thing for radio access network, we have built XRAN controller uh, using ONAS and then there are those applications that run on top of it. Fabric, I already mentioned that. And then this is our computing stack. Uh, that is built, and then XOS, which I told you, is our service orchestration, service composition, and uh, that um, operating system. And then on top of that, you can have these paradigms, access as a service, subscriber as a service, and those kinds of things you could support on top of XOS, okay? So this is one way of looking at the software stack. Another way to look at it is uh, this way, where what you have is at the underneath, you have all these hardware resources, uh, for access, computing, as well as fabric. And then we have all the different kinds of services. Some services are infrastructure services like ONOS and ONOS applications. And then there are some uh, that are more like the virtual network functions and uh, other kinds of services. And XOS is the layer on the top uh, that provides all the control. And what is shown on the right hand side is we are using a paradigm similar to SDN even for managing services. There is a control plane for managing services, and then there is something you can think of as the data plane for services. And XOS is like the control plane for services, and then all the data plane is implemented either in hardware or the virtual network functions that are implemented as services. Another way to look at the stack is this way, ONOS, OpenStack, and XOS. I think. Now it makes sense. So let me give you a little bit of um, uh, idea about ONOS, and then I'll say a little bit about XOS, and hopefully that will be helpful. So when you think about ONOS as an SDN controller, it is built as a scale-out design. So what it has is there can be multiple instances of ONOS. Uh, they are identical, and you can run this on servers, or you can run them in containers or VMs, and then you have kind of a scale-out design. And as you know, in the SDN world, the whole idea about the controller is to create what you can think of as the global network view or the global state, and it offers that state to applications that are running on top of that. If you take, and then of course, there is the HA kinds of thing that either individual functions were to fail or an entire instance were to fail, the workload migrates to other instances and the uh, system continues to work, uh, and that is something uh, we have done with ONOS uh, and so on. If you take a little bit more inside look uh, on ONOS, you will see there are three layers uh, inside this ONOS. Uh, the southbound is what connects to different types of southbound protocol. Even though our own emphasis is on open flow and P4 going forward, 
the vendor community wants to use all different kinds of protocols to connect from controller to their devices, uh, BGP, LS to NetConf to, you know, there's a whole half a dozen or a dozen more protocol that ONOS supports now. Uh, but that is uh, because that's what people want with their legacy devices. The southbound does discovery of the devices, is observes, and then it of course does the programming and configuration of those devices. Then the distributed core is the very important piece of ONOS, that is the one that does the, all the distributed state management, um, provides scalability and performance and all of that that comes because of the distributed core uh, that we have implemented. And that in many ways is the kind of the key aspect of ONOS that gives the scalability performance and high availability that is needed in a service provider SDN controller. Uh, then of course we have a northbound abstraction which is uh, intent based. By the way, this happened before Cisco started to use the word intent. We have been using intent framework and all of that in ONAS well before Cisco started uh, making a big deal about it. And again, the idea is that you start with a very high level description of what you want. Um, if you are an application developer, you really don't care about flows and flow table entries and any one of those things. You want to specify what you want to do at a pretty high level and then have something that translates that into flow table manipulations and flow uh, programming and all of that and that's what our application intent framework does. Okay, so that is kind of a quick overview of uh, the architecture. So I think ONAS has been there for four years or more and we have been doing releases every quarter and now we are on something like uh, N release or something and you know it has been used in many different use cases, applications and so on uh, and its scale out design and all of that has been proven out at this point. Okay. Uh, we also support model based configuration of devices and services. This is something we started doing much later, uh, but now we are, um, you know, coming up to speed and uh, supporting that. Uh, now the emphasis is on something called in-service software upgrade because as we are moving more and more towards deployment and commercial use, people care about this in-service upgrade and that's what we are uh, trying to add uh, to ONOS. Uh, performance and scalability, so you know something like we support 3 million operations per second, uh, flow ops per second which is uh, very good, we haven't seen numbers like that from anywhere else uh, and intents per second, 10 millisecond kind of latency time, so if there is an event that comes into ONOS within 10 millisecond we are able to process it and reprogram the switches. Uh, not including the time to program the switches, but the ONOS end-to-end -end latency is less than 10 millisecond, which is again something very good and we have maintained that for over many years. Southbound, as I said, the focus was open flow to begin with. Now there are uh, many, I mean legacy vendors have added support for many, many other protocols. But now we are again coming back to the SDN native protocols and the focus is turning to more P4. So how we can support P4 based um, programming of the devices and XRAN, if you are not familiar with XRAN, this is another very interesting protocol in the wireless side uh, for cellular networks. That is how do you program E node B by extracting all the control from E node B and putting it in a controller. So we are supporting XRAN as well. Okay, uh, application, there is a whole bunch of applications now that we and others have written, uh, you know, that you can see. Okay, so I think I want to spend little time on talking about XOS, but let me take a pause. I can't read. Are you following it? I mean, I know it does not have as much technical depth that really you would want, uh, but is this making sense? Am I communicating? Okay, so far so good. <laughs> Okay, so let me uh, tell you uh, briefly about XOS. As I said, this stands for everything as a service operating system. And this does all the service. Uh, and we look at everything as a service and then service composition, life cycle management, all of that is done by XOS. And XOS itself is also implemented as a microservices based architecture. Uh, what you see is that at the top layer, there is this you know, at the center of it is the data model. So, you know, all the services specify the data model and then you bring them into uh, a database and then when you are doing service composition and so on, you are essentially leveraging uh, those data models. And then on top, uh, we provide different kinds of views and APIs, uh, you know, so for GUI, REST API, Tosca, Yang we don't support on top of XOS yet, uh, but that is something on the to-do list, for example. And then what you see, 
down, those are we call synchronizers. So when you have any services in our system in COD, uh, you have to write the synchronizer, uh, little bit of a synchronizer logic and that is what basically specifying the model and how you synchronize with XOS. And once you write that little bit of uh, logic to connect with XOS, then XOS is able to do, as I mentioned, the uh, lifecycle management, the composition and all of that. And so if you are a VNF writer or if you are a service writer, what you do is you can write every, anything that you do. And then at the end of it, if you want to connect into XOS, you have to do maybe you know a couple of hours of work or maybe a couple of days of work to be able to write and we provide recipes using which you can connect into XOS and then you become part of the system and you can be managed and uh, your service of uh, this can be managed and composed with other services. And then what you do is once you have many of these services, for example, this is an example of if you are a residential subscriber, you are coming into at and network and at and is trying to offer you a set of services. What you are doing is you are creating a service graph. Okay? And you can see that every service has what with that controller, that controller is nothing but the synchronization logic that I mentioned earlier that you have to write. And then you can see you can construct an arbitrary service graph. What is shown here is virtual OLT. So this is the service that is managing that pizza box that is the OLT device. You come in, then there is a subscriber gateway. So that is the one that is interfacing to all the subscribers. It has all the information about subscribers and what kinds of services and authentication and all of that can be done by that service. And then either you can go to CDN if you have subscribed to a CDN service from at and as an example, then you can use the CDN service and then you can go to virtual router. So virtual router is like a BNG implemented in a very different way but serves that purpose. And so you can connect to the, uh, the backbone uh, internet or internet at large, uh, get your services, come back and then you are then. Uh, what is shown at the bottom in terms of OpenStack, ONOS and monitoring, as I mentioned in our world, we think of everything as a service. So even ONOS or the monitoring, all of these sort of things are considered as a service and they are part of that service graph. Okay? And that is what, so there are, you know, right now when we look at it uh, in the core, there may be 10 plus service graphs that people have instantiated for different types of customers, whether you're residential, mobile or whatever enterprise and then each one has their own var varieties. And so you can instantiate the service graphs and that's what XOS manages. And some of those functions are implemented in hardware on the uh, fabric itself or the OLT devices or the e -Node B or the radio access network. And the combination of that hardware and software gives you this end-to-end -end service, okay? Uh, I think this automated provisioning, I think I may skip this, but these are the tool chain that we are using in order to do this automated configuration and provisioning um, and we still have long ways to go honestly. So as I mentioned, if you use exactly the same configuration that we have in our lab, then it is close to zero touch. Okay? But if you deviate from those configurations, it is still a very painful exercise to bring up a card pod. I mean, I'll be honest with you that it's not, I wish it could be uh, very painless, but we are not there yet. Uh, because of all the building blocks that are part of COD, both hardware and software, and being able to bring up. So right now, our biggest challenge is in this area. Uh, and, you know, some of you, if you want to participate, I mean, we do have these nightly builds, and now we are doing this build in our own uh, facility, but there are in QCT, and there are other partners, CNI and others, where we do this nightly builds, and you can see, I have taken a snapshot where mostly it is green, but honestly, it's not. Most of the time, it is not green, and we still have long ways to go to make this truly a very simple automated configuration and monitoring stuff. Okay, I think uh, I want to quickly go through. Uh, you know, this whenever you build a platform, building platform by itself is not particularly interesting unless you build some solutions that are enabled by the platform. And this is kind of the virtuous cycle. You build the solution, then you realize what is wrong with your platform, then you can make your platform better, then you can build better services, uh, solutions, and you go through this loop. 
and that is what we have done in computer science or computer history to be able to do this successfully. And so the same thing we have done, we started with Cord as a platform and as I mentioned to you, we have created the residential version, mobile version, enterprise version and the, the analytics uh, version and that is how we kind of go back in this loop and that is how, uh, you know, we are trying to make it better. So let me specifically walk you through uh, the residential, mobile and enterprise in next whatever 10 minutes or so. So when it comes to the COD platform, it is the common one, the fabric, software stack, all of that is common. There is nothing different uh, when you go from uh, different thing. But if you are building for residential, then you have to use the GPON and XGS pawn and the service portfolio is different. Uh, because for residential you need different types of a Jeep on, you need different types of services than you need for say 4G or 5G and that's what we have done. So as I mentioned, uh, when it comes to OLT devices, uh, traditionally they are very big, big boxes. Uh, what we have tried to do with OCP, AT&T and others is to turn these big boxes into pizza boxes and based on merchant silicon white boxes coming from ODM and all the software is now running in these uh, uh, kind of services that you see on top of that. So all that software that used to be inside the box, a lot of that software is now running as services uh, on top of the platform and the box is relatively simple and it is open flow enabled uh, box, okay. Uh, so uh, maybe, okay, I have a slide I, I didn't know. So this is how the box looks like. We have turned that into this kind of a software stack. You can see at the bottom there's the pizza box, then there's the OLT agent uh, that is talking the L2 and OMCI protocol. On the top, it is talking open flow protocol. It goes into ONOS and there's a set of services on the top. Now what we are trying to do is that it has happened in the package switching world as well, that there are different types of OLT devices that are coming from different merchant silicon vendors and ODMs and so uh, interfacing ONAS to each one of them is very difficult. So we have created something called Volta as a hardware abstraction layer and then all your software stack at the top doesn't have to change. You only have to have a plug into the Volta and a vendor can plug into that and then you are set, okay. Um, uh, and then similarly on the radio access side, as I mentioned, uh, we have done the same thing uh, that rather than having this big E node Bs, uh, they are either running on uh, some pizza box kinds of devices or actually in many cases with the help of CAVM as an example, they are running on an ARM processor, all the BBUs are running that and then software is running in terms of services uh, on the top. And then not only that, uh, uh, if you are familiar with the cellular network, there is this whole thing called EPC. Uh, the packet core and the packet core again um, uh, so far has been you know uh, either big boxes with lots of software or a lot of proprietary software. Uh, what we have done uh, in last couple of years is disaggregate that whole EPC into the control plane, the user plane and all of this is implemented as uh, now services that are managed by XOS and these are all virtualized running in containers or VMs. Uh, and it's all open source. Uh, again, because it is all open source, I want to make the disclaimer, this is not ready for prime time in some sense, these are not production quality, but first time in the history of cellular network that these things are becoming open source and that people can contribute, participate and build on uh, and that's a very uh, powerful capability and that if we can raise it to the production level and take it to the next level, it will have a huge impact on this mobile cellular industry and the world um, and you know, we'll see how things play out as we go forward, okay. So these are some of the examples of POCs that we have done in the context of uh, mobility space on top of COD, uh, XRAN integration as I mentioned, this is like an open flow protocol but it is more in the cellular thing, we take the E node B, extract all the control. Then the specification is uh, XRAN and then we have implemented that on top of ONOS. We have shown that open source EPC, uh, hybrid card, uh, this is kind of combination of residential and mobility card all packaged in one. Actually this is done, by the way when I say we, 
don't think of we means open networking foundation we are only 30 people 35 people okay when i say we it is the whole community uh, that we work with so there are you know depending on how we look at it there are 100 organizations that are part of this community and so when i say we there are these 100 companies that have worked together in order to enable this so in this card hybrid case this is with deutsche telecom that we did that then uh, KVM has built the entire card using ARM uh, processors rather than Intel processors and x pliant chipset rather than the Broadcom chipset, uh, CBRS and private LTE, this is with Google and uh, to some extent TIP, um, this is this unlicensed band uh, thing and then end to end slicing of radio network as well as EPC. So these are the kinds of things we have done. I will skip the enterprise one, but this is just one sentence. So we also allow uh, enterprises to create virtual networks on demand on the service providers network. And then for that virtual networks, we can provide different kinds of functions, firewall, load balancing and all of that. So we have done that as well. Okay. And then this is kind of the list of services. As I mentioned, there is a portfolio of now 25 plus services that are now available on top of the card platform. And they are from common infrastructure services for residential card that is uh, GPON and XGSPON, M card services for LTE or the future 5G kinds of stuff, uh, E card and some edge services. Okay, so there are all these services now that are available that are on top. And I don't know how many of you are in the business of writing VNFs. But if your company or you write VNFs, uh, especially for service provider space, we would love to get your VNFs and be able to, and in your VNFs can be closed, proprietary, no problem at all. Uh, but we would like to demonstrate how your VNFs can be integrated on the card platform and be able to use, and as I said, there are many providers that are interested in that. Okay, I think, uh, so, as far as the card is concerned, we have done only four releases so far. We are about to do another release, uh, intermediate release that we are calling 4.1. So as you can see, card is relatively new. Uh, we have done only four releases and we still have long ways to go. Uh, and But what is happening is as we are coming to 4.0 and 4.1, the individual subsystems are now going from proof of concept to developer friendly to now service provider friendly, okay? So that now service providers can take it. Still it is not easy, but we are making it easier uh, with time. Uh, they are going from proof of concept quality to field trial. So there are a couple of providers uh, that are doing field trial. And I don't know how many of you work with service providers, but service providers to do a field trial is a huge deal. I mean, the barrier you have to cross for them to do a field trial is a big deal. And so we are lucky that at least some of them are now doing field trial with COD. Uh, the VNFs, uh, we used to do a lot of this handcrafting of VNFs to be able to instantiate. Now we are doing a lot of that with XOS. You write that little bit of recipe, follow the recipe, write the synchronizer code, and then you are done. Uh, and so that is becoming easy to follow. Uh, now we are bringing them together and thing. Okay, so I guess, again, as I said, I'm, uh, I'm in this business of promoting ONF, open networking and card. So I may be sounding, uh, you know, uh, like a salesman and I'm bad, I'm sorry about that. But still, I believe that card is now really, uh, you know, there is a potential for it to really take off. But by no means, I want to communicate that we are done. Honestly, we are just kind of at the point of where we have POC, we have captured the imagination of this large service provider industry. They are giving it a chance to be able to do trials, but long ways to go. And I really hope that some of you will take a closer look uh, at COD and would want to participate and contribute to it as well. And the reason I feel, even though I, am not, I have not been a developer for now many, many years, uh, honestly, but when I look at it, I think you care about things that are intellectually challenging and rewarding. I can tell you with high confidence that there are many problems in building of the card even today that are intellectually very rewarding and difficult. How do you do? I kind of made it sound simple to do service composition, but doing service compositions and creating the service graph and how to make that work uh, in software and hardware and all of that is extremely hard. And we are solving some many hard problems there 
uh, and the same thing with fabric uh, and uh, interfacing with this LTE or 5G. You know, there are many, many hard problems there. We are, even though we are working in the service provider space, a lot of times people tell me, you know, service providers are the least progressive, they are not the thing. But even in that space, we are bringing some of the latest technologies uh, from, you know, Kubernetes to container base to this XOS, all of these, and some of the device technologies, the 5G and all of that that we are working with is pretty state of the art what we are doing. If we are successful, we are not there yet, but we are on a path to having this impact. So if we can really help transform the service provider infrastructure, oh, this is a huge impact. I mean, something you know you don't get to do often. And in terms of if you care about the billion dollar value, this is like 100 to 200 billion dollar industry. Uh, AT&T itself spends 20 billion dollar a year in buying capex. Okay, so. Sometimes we don't take service providers seriously, but when you look at the infrastructure they build and how much money they spend, it's pretty significant. Okay? And, you know, as I mentioned, today I don't have time to talk about the community, but we also have a pretty large community. As I said, 100 companies uh, all over the world and fun. I think I'm almost done. So this is my last slide. I think I've made all these points. So I will just save the time. Okay? Let's thank our speaker. Uh, all right. can, you, can you take some questions? Oh, sure. Love to. All as right. many as you can, you know, you have time for. Yeah, we, we, have, we have time. So uh, if you have a question for Guru, uh, we have uh, uh, mics at, at both sides of the, of, of the room, or I can uh, run the mic uh, off, uh, off to people if you raise your hand. Looks like we've got one over here. As usual, nice talk. So uh, right now in 5G, there are uh, some efforts are going on to have fix in mobile convergence. Mm -hmm. And we are talking about like a R code separate and M code separate. So how do you see where the industry is moving and what is, in, if, if that fix in mobile convergence do happen, then what will be the code architect look like? Will still be same, same like R code separate and M code separate? No, no, no. So I agree. Yes, I, excellent question. And I think I glossed over this, but uh, you are right. This is one of the top three priorities for COD to bring the residential and M codes together. And I briefly mentioned that at MWC Americas in San Francisco with Deutsche Telekom, we de demonstrated what I call hybrid COD. And that hybrid COD is so Deutsche Telekom tried to show that on the same platform you can have. Uh, M and R and the same subscriber can be connected to residential and mobility and you can move and still the services can continue to run. So that is definitely one of the things we are uh, wanting to do and our service provider customers care a lot about. So uh, we have, I mean, Deutsche Telekom did it in a very limited way, but that is going to become a priority for us in 2018. I have two questions. Uh, the first might be kind of a dumb question, but I think I was paying attention fairly carefully, and I don't think I heard IoT devices mentioned. Uh, Sorry? And IoT, IoT devices. Uh -huh. So is Core going to be supporting IoT uh, devices? So uh, I think there are people that are talking about, you know, IoT may be spread in the field, but uh, Core can be like a gateway. Uh, and then you connect into the rest of the service provider or the cloud infrastructure. So you can think of COD as a gateway, but it is, it's a significant infrastructure. That's not something that you do it with every IoT, but uh, as a gateway, it can be. And that is, some of the people are talking about that. Thanks. And then my other question is, um, kind of in a nutshell, since the whole project is open source, what's your business plan to make it viable? <laughs> um, very, very good question. This is. Uh, so, at the ONF board level where we have eight service providers that are our board members, uh, that is the number one question that is being talked about. So I'll tell you, when we started some of these work at Open Networking Lab and so on, the model was that some of the existing vendors will step up and will take this and want to commercialize it. Okay, because now you can see we have done POCs, we are starting to do field trial, there are almost 20 tier one providers that are wanting to do it. 
and we would have thought that this much traction in service provider space will mean many vendors will want to step up and commercialize. It is very curious that many of our um, incumbent vendors are not wanting to do that and you know it's kind of puzzling why. Maybe one of the reasons can be that it's too much based on merchant silicon white boxes, open source, so maybe it's too disruptive. That is maybe one explanation. Another explanation is uh, what they are saying is we want to clearly see how service providers are going to roll it out. And once they know how it is going to be rolled out, then they will step up and commercialize it. So they're like a chicken and egg problem. And there is a lot of debate that is going on at the ONF board level and service providers how to commercialize this and how to take it. So if you are there are entrepreneurs here and you are looking for an opportunity, but it's not for the faintest heart because service doing startup for service provider space is not an easy thing to do, but there seems to be an opportunity here. Now I don't know how to, you know, but something to think about. I hope, I mean, I'm sorry, that is the best answer I can give you. Uh, we have time for one more. Hey Guru, good talk. Um, basic question, how does ONUS interact with ONAP and Etsy and all these other ah, very good. acronyms? That, okay, know. very good question. So I think it is um, less about ONUS versus XOS because if you look at it, what, when we said COD, right? So COD is at the edge of the network and then, uh, you know, ONAP, think of ONAP as a global automation and orchestration platform, right? And so it is automating and orchestrating across many edges. And so, uh, I mean, there is a whole presentation we can walk through how ONAP can interface to XOS and how ONAP can pass on service descriptions and all using Tosca to something like XOS. And then XOS can instantiate and manage those services within the edge of the uh, network. But uh, so, so that is so there is something we are working on, uh, and I can give you more details uh, later. Okay. All right, uh, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.